When I was seven, my family built a house. My parents said I could paint my room any color I wanted. I painted it my favorite color, a specific shade of blue. It's crazy how years before I started listening to Weezer, before I even knew the name Rivers Cuomo, Brian Bell, Pat Wilson, or Matt Sharp, before any of that, you could show me this specific shade of blue, and I'd think, oh, Weezer, how do you do that? How do you trademark a color? Not literally, these aren't the Fine Bros or Disney. I mean, how do you begin to make something this iconic? Well, an album is a good start. If you want to know the gritty details about the origins of Rivers Cuomo and Weezer before the Blue Album, I made a whole video on it that you can check out. If not, here's a quick summary. Rivers Cuomo is a nerdy kid who, after years of growing up in a cult, moves out and struggles to adapt to everyday life. Bullied in school, he finds solace in music and eventually realizes he wants to be a rock star. He moves to California, makes some friends, and after a lot of trial and error, Weezer is formed, and they're signed with Geffen a few short months later. Saved from the hellish uncertainty of being an indie band, you'd think this was like being pulled to heaven. Instead, it was more like limbo. Neither living nor dead, signed to a major label with no fan base, no albums, and therefore nothing concrete. They were running on the fumes of potential, and they knew it. Initially, Rivers and the band wanted to keep things simple. Record and produce their first album themselves, protected from expensive failure by the cheap comfort of their own garage. But the man that got them signed to Geffen, Todd Sullivan, saw more than that in them. He knew they were ready for the big leagues, even if they didn't. With his influence, they were convinced to send demo tapes to some big names to possibly produce. In the mix was Lenny Kay of the Patti Smith Group, Paul Colderi and Sean Slade, producers for Pixies, and most importantly, Rick Okasik of the cars. Thank you. Thank you. No, no. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I say most importantly because secretly he was the only one Rivers cared about. Obviously, the other choices were more than equipped to help the band, but Cuomo had recently bought the cars' greatest hits and was obsessed. In fact, he and the other members of Weezer found Rick to be so talented that they almost didn't expect a response. Regardless, they sent the demo tapes and calmly waited. You've got mail. Well, shit. Shockingly, Rick was intrigued by the band, though not totally convinced. He later commented, their demo was just a thick slab of mud with some music mixed in. Harsh, but true. He only agreed to produce the project after hearing the boys rehearse and, like many before him, seeing their potential. The only catch was that they'd have to fly out to Manhattan and record on Okasek's home turf. Again, this meant further ballooning the budget of an already fragile album. By accepting Rick's offer, the Weezers were essentially gambling with the entirety of their music careers. Succeed now, or never have the chance again. It took many late nights of serious debate, but they bit the bullet. Apple Cuomo was coming home. After short negotiations, the gang was set to fly out on the morning of August 8th. With that in mind, it can only be assumed that these responsible young men went to sleep extra early on the night of August 7th to ensure they were fully rested for their flight. Oh, sorry? They were 23 years old? I see. They threw a rager. According to Carl Koch, a close friend of the band, among other things, we were awoken after about 45 minutes of sleep by DDC's Denise McDonald, who took our ragged forms to LAX. A great start to what I can assure you was a smooth production. You know I'm lying. If I was to define the production of the Blue Album in one word, it would be uncertain. These were a bunch of guys with awe-inspiring talent, and Rivers Cuomo especially had a killer work ethic. But they lacked confidence. So while at first the band lavished in their fancy Greenwich Village Hotel, dined upon the exquisite cuisine of the Empire State, and swiftly organized a track listing after one session at SIR, cracks were beginning to form in their seemingly slick operation. An early example comes during the production of The World Has Turned and Left Me Here at Rick's Electric Lady Studios. Six hours alone were spent figuring out the song's guitar solo when a writer's block stricken Cuomo finally admitted defeat. Lying on the studio floor pondering his failure, a soft voice came in over the mic. How about something like, da da da, d d d. 
<gasps> this was the voice of the album's producer, Rick Okasik, who in many ways was the band's saving grace. Think of him like Weezer's Obi-Wan Kenobi, taking someone who exhibited great talents and steering them in the right direction. Oh my god, I meant Luke! Decades after completing the album, the band would regularly work with Rick time and again, and upon his death in 2019, Weezer's Instagram account made a post calling him the biggest sweetheart in the industry. Okasik was the perfect producer for this album. Not only was he a significant influence musically, but he was also just fun to hang around. Carl Koch again recounts the story of one night when Rick took the boys out on a ride downtown after a long day in the studio. A debate was raging. Rick was saying how Weezer was a great band and that he was sure they'd do well. The band was saying they didn't have a chance. Rick said something like, oh yeah? Check this out. We pulled up next to CBGB's and Rick lowered the windows. Confused clubgoers glanced over to see the car's band leader in a Land Rover with a pack of goofy looking dudes. Rick shouts, hey! These guys? Uh, suddenly, having lost the plot, he floors it. We were laughing for blocks. Although Rick mentored the band well, he couldn't prevent the inevitable. Those cracks were only widening. After four weeks in the studio, the band was getting desperately close to going over budget. They were just one week away from having to answer to some angry Geffen executives when the largest pot boiled over. The one containing this fucking guy. I can only imagine how confused those of you who skipped my Weezer origin video must be seeing Jason Cropper all over the place. As the band's original rhythm guitarist, he was obviously around for most of the Blue Album's production. He did his job well at the surface level, as early demos reveal, but things get complicated the deeper you dig. As it stands, there are three first-hand perspectives I've found online. The ever-reputable Carl Koch pins his firing on him going through a lot of stuff personally, that he couldn't keep from over overflowing into his performance and presence in the band. Matt Sharp, Weezer's then bassist, backs this up, telling Rolling Stone, there was no single event that triggered us letting Jason go, only tiny infractions. However, Jason himself remembers things much less vaguely, pushing the blame firmly on Cuomo's no girlfriends while we're recording diktat. Sounds weird, but Rivers had long been ousting band members for what they did in their personal lives. He took music deathly seriously, now more than ever, and Jason's pregnant girlfriend was apparently a liability he couldn't stomach. Cropper also blames Matt Sharp's jealousy in that same Rolling Stone interview, but that's neither here nor there. Today, things are amicable between the former rhythm guitarist and the band, with Jason even calling himself a huge fan. But hey, back here in the past, we need a rhythm guitarist. As I mentioned earlier, Weezer was already desperately close to going over budget. The last thing they needed was to report to Geffen that they had just fired a fourth of their band. Instead, they had to find a replacement quick. And thankfully, they had one in their back pocket. Hi, Brian. It's Matt. Oh, hey. How's it going? Are you guys recording? Yeah, uh, so what are you up to these days? Hey, it's Rivers. Can you sing? What? I, I guess so. Why? What's your favorite Star Wars action figure? Uh, Hammerhead? Do you want to be in Weezer? What? Hell yeah! That was weird, huh? You see, back in the 90s, 1992 to be exact, Matt and Rivers had made the acquaintance of Brian Bell, the basis for a semi-successful band called Carnival Art. Although the two had never seen Brian play guitar and they'd hardly spoken to him in two years, they were confident he had the chops. Why? He had one of those slight frames that kind of resembled the long lineage of wafer-thin anorexic archetypal guitar gods that we all grew up on. Brian Bell got the audition because he looked like a good guitarist. And they were right. Brian overnighted them a tape of him performing some Weezer songs, with him even taking guesses at the lyrics, and the band was more than impressed. Better yet, Brian had passed the most important part of his recruitment with flying colors. That's right, the Star Wars question was actually a deciding factor. You see, this was a pack of vulnerable nerds who had just kicked out their rhythm guitarist for having a girlfriend. They needed the right guy. They needed a dork, a geek, a dweeb, a goob. The next day, Brian Bell was flown to New York and dropped into the frantic scramble that was the last week of production. He knocked on River's hotel room door, only to be greeted with, first thing is, you have to grow a mustache, because we're all gonna have mustaches on the front cover. Brian responded, are you sure? And sadly, he wasn't. Brian was then notified he'd be bunking with Pat, who I somehow haven't mentioned since the intro, and again, he knocked on the door. 
So I go to Pat's room, and Pat goes, Welcome to Weezer. And he just pulls his pants down and moons me. And I'm like, what the hell have I gotten into? Outside of the odd introduction, Brian fit in perfectly. He was even able to squeeze in some backing vocals before production rap, but unfortunately, Rivers was forced to redo all the guitar stuff himself. Things were getting down to the wire. It reached the point where mixing was being done by Rick and engineer Chris Shaw in Studio C, while Brian and Rivers were still recording in Studio B. In the end, mixing was finished a week late, leaving the album 15% over budget. The day the Weezers were dreading had finally come. But rather than being chewed out by the execs, they were congratulated. The album was essentially finished, and it sounded good. Really good. So good, nobody really fussed about the budget. Mixing wrapped in October, mastering in November. Rick took the gang out to see the Blue Man Group, ironically, and with that, they said their goodbyes and flew back to Los Angeles. The hard part? was over. Right? I mean, the album was done. Only an arbitrary date chosen by Geffen stood in the way of Blue's release, so Rivers should have been able to sit back and relax. But something was off. The first hint at this came shortly after, when Cuomo was out for lunch with Todd Sullivan, the man that got Weezer signed to Geffen. There, Todd had nothing but praise for the album, commending its humor and even going as far as to call them a comical band. This may seem like harmless praise, but for Rivers, it was a waking nightmare. He later explained in a Rolling Stone interview, I seriously thought we were the next Nirvana, and I thought the world was going to perceive us that way like a super important, super powerful, heartbreaking heavy rock band, and as serious artists. That's how I saw us. With this praise from Todd Sullivan, the frontman was realizing that his message may be misconstrued. Though, it's not like he was blindsided. He nearly scrapped the song Buddy Holly for that reason, at least temporarily. It was actually Rick Okasek who convinced him to put it on the album, even though Rivers feared it would make the band look bad. To quote Matt Sharp, we had the sense that it could be taken as a novelty song, and people aren't gonna take the album seriously. The band's real mistake was in assuming that Buddy Holly would be the only one taken as a novelty. Many other songs the album, like the sweater song, reflected Rivers' quote, darkest thoughts, yet were still seen through that comical lens. Like Tommy Wiseau on the opening night of The Room, Rivers heard only laughs from those witnessing his heartache. So, just as Rivers was starting to regret the choices that he made on the project, and even some that he'd made in his own life, the day had finally come. The disconnect between listener and writer only widened with the album's release. Although not a massive hit, only debuting on Billboard's Top 200 16 weeks after release at number 170, it saw a slow rise in the following months, finally reaching its peak position on February 4th, 1995. This gradual growth can widely be credited to the album's now iconic music videos. More specifically, these two, directed by a then unknown Spike Jones. Today, you'd possibly recognize that name for projects like her and being John Malkovich, but in 1994, he was really just a friend of the band. Or a friend of everyone in the band but Rivers, fittingly, who only picked him for the job because his sweater song pitch didn't mention any sweaters, instead leaning into that whole blue thing that I swear I'll come back to in a bit. Though the climb was slow compared to other artists, the album's critical reception was near universally positive, with praise around the board for blues, classic harmonies, captivating melodies, powerful hooks, and one-of-a-kind style, you'd think the band had hit an easy home run. But the 90s were no time for easy home runs. Alright, you know what I mean. I mentioned near the start of this video how Weezer was in a tough spot with Geffen since they had no initial fan base and no albums when they signed. This meant they were lacking in something important, credibility. However, the band was misguided in believing the scrutiny would come from record execs. Nay, twas the very nerds with whom they identified that hated them most. No, not the D&D Star Wars type nerds, I mean the alt-rock nerds. Let's circle back real quick. No fan base, no albums, a big record company contract, and mainstream success upon arrival. Though not necessarily a common mindset, it was often agreed among certain circles that Weezer were industry plants and therefore posers. Yucky. All Music even commented on this phenomenon in their second review of the album a few years later. Nevertheless, during Alt Rock's heyday of 1994, Weezer was second only to Stone Temple Pilots as an object of scorn, bashed by the rock critics and hipsters alike. Thankfully, this mindset subsided with time, but it was no less a hurtful blow to an already sensitive Cuomo. 
just as he feared, even the positive reviews of the album followed a similar pattern, with Rolling Stone complimenting the band's self-deprecating humor and an earlier all-music review doubling down by saying, what makes the band so enjoyable is their charming geekiness. Instead of singing about despair, they sing about love, which is kind of refreshing in the gloom-drenched world of 90s guitar pop. Needless to say, this was far from the acclaim Rivers expected for the next Nirvana. If that somehow wasn't bad enough, it seemed even the star part of Rockstar wasn't working either. A passing glance at interviews from the era shows Cuomo's discomfort with fame. Almost every other band member speaks more than him, and when he does talk, it's often in a low mumble, with the smile on his face confirming he isn't trying to come off like a stoic jerk to impress the viewers at home. This is his best attempt at looking comfortable on camera. Nothing was working. The reception wasn't what he wanted, the fame wasn't what he wanted, the nerds had turned on him, it wasn't a good fit. None of it was. And he knew it. That's why, during the Blue Album tour, when Rivers was supposed to revel in the success he had been building towards since high school, he wrote Longtime Sunshine instead. Sometimes I wanna pack it all up, get on a bus and move to Vermont or Maine. Or any of those states back east that I remember. Sometimes I wanna go back to school in East Coast College with some history. I'd be satisfied, I know, in the simple things. And when the Blue Album tour wrapped and all was said and done, he did just that. He sent out applications to some Ivy League schools and broke the news to Brian Bell first. I think I want to go to school and be a classical musician. Brian and the other band members reacted about the way you'd expect. Hey, dude, are you okay? What the fuck, can we please keep doing this? That sounds about right. Although everyone insists there was never any actual fear of the band breaking up, it was a mighty shakeup. With Rivers flying out to Massachusetts to study at Harvard in the fall of 1995, the future that once seemed so unstoppable was put on ice. Now, as you hang off that cliff I hurled you towards, why don't we take a look forward, beyond all the drama, and breathe in this album's. <laughs> Discussing the legacy of the Blue Album is a task unlike anything I've tackled on my channel. It feels wrong to focus on the album's lingering critical appreciation or its influence on alternative rock. That's just not what defines the Blue Album in my eyes. As odd as it sounds, the music isn't what first comes to mind when mentioning this album. It's this cover. This simple, strange, awkward, iconic album cover is the most recognizable piece of Weezer media, period. More than the Buddy Holly Lick, Rivers Mustache, or Oh My Gamut It's Weezer, it's this silly little photo. It brings us back to the question posed at the beginning of the video. How do you begin to make something this iconic? And while a quality album is a good start, there's more to it than that. Designed by none other than Carl Koch himself, it took a lot more trial and error than you'd expect. Carl would bring Rivers all sorts of weird ideas, only to be met by the same note. Simpler. Cuomo would later explain in an iTunes interview, I remember having a very strong vision for the first album, the Blue Album, what that cover was gonna look like. This vision, while strong, was hard to put into words. Only after Rivers found a cheap cassette of popular Beach Boys songs titled Do It Again could he visualize what he wanted. A specific shade of blue. A specific childhood memory. A specific tone and style all his own. The glasses, frames, bowl cut, dickies, blue t-shirt, and windbreaker. It was all purposeful. All meant to invoke something familiar while being all its own. That's what I love about this album. On the surface, its success almost seems like a fluke, a first outing by a newly formed band that just so happened to hit all the right buttons. But this cover shows us something more. It showed that even this album, produced in uncertainty by a band trapped in limbo, masterminded by a regretful auteur, still had a clear vision. Even if Rivers and company didn't know it, they were laying the groundwork for something more. Delicately balancing different sounds, tones, and aesthetics, this album cover isn't just a symbol for this album. It's a symbol for the band as a whole. It ensures that before you start listening to Weezer, before you know the name Rivers, Cuomo, Brian Bell, Pat Wilson, or Matt Sharp, before any of that, you know who these guys are. Strange, awkward, nerdy, and charming. This is Weezer. 
If you liked the video, please be sure to like. If you liked me, subscribe. I make a lot of videos about Weezer, and I'm working on a Pinkerton video as we speak. Anyways, I still don't know how to end these. See ya. Oh, also, it looks really funny, and people made memes about it, so that's probably why it's so iconic.